We've heard the events leading up to the firing of the Proteus wave, and we've heard of the other events of the first part of 3308. The now seemingly trivial squabbling within Empire, Federation and Alliance. From August onwards, all anyone was thinking about was the Stargoids. What they were, where they were heading, and what did they want? We were to find out soon enough. Three weeks after the Proteus wave was fired in HIP-22460, a strange distant light was noticed moving across the star field. It was initially a dull orange glow, but as closer observation became possible, the light took on a distinct shape, with an orange-yellow centre radiating a helix of green and blue. As the weeks passed, it became clear that this object was moving purposefully from star to star making its way towards the core human systems in the area we know of as the Bubble. And more of the stars were identified, also closing in on the Bubble. By the 23rd of October, there were eight of these rogue signal sources, or Stargoids as they were dubbed. They moved at erratic speeds, but their direction was clear. The sounds they gave off, audible in the full-spectrum scanner, gave little doubt that the Stargoids were Thargoid in origin. But what were they? And what was their intention? Despite Salvation's successes in having Aegis sidelined and eventually shut down, the remnants of the organisation remained active, centred around its former head of research, Professor Albert Tezro, and the Thargoid and Guardian specialists Ishmael Palin and Ram Tar. Commanders had discovered, soon after the Proteus wave was fired, that all active Thargoid structures now, processed Guardian relics into something different. Green, glowing crystals, provisionally known as unclassified relics. Their theory was that the Proteus wave had somehow become assimilated into the Thargoid hive mind, and that the Thargoids had somehow become better able to cope with the threat of Guardian technology. They appealed for as many samples of these new unclassified relics as possible, and also arranged for increased payouts for xenobiological scans, in the expectation that they can use this knowledge to develop better defences against the Thargoids. Professor Tezro was able to take into her care the only known survivor of Azimuth's terrible experiments to splice human test subjects into Thargoid scouts in 3303. Xiao Jin I, known to Azimuth as D2, had been implanted with technology that gave us some insight into Thargoid communication and the Thargoid hive mind. She explained to Tezro that the Thargoid roar heard on the 9th of August was a call and a response, with the response roughly translated as We see them. We are coming. And the former Azimuth test subject explained that this was not a good thing, and that she was certain the Thargoids had decided to take action against humanity. Professors Palin and Tezro concluded that the Second Thargoid War was about to enter a new, potentially far more intense phase. The Aegis statement was criticised for being needlessly alarmist. Markets weakened, there were protest rallies. The superpowers seemed unwilling to take any decisive action to prepare, with the Empire refusing to cooperate with the Federation and Alliance. There were a few small-scale skirmishes when Thargoids entered several peripheral systems, but the Thargoids left again a week later without attempting to damage any starports. It is now believed that these Thargoids were gathering, waiting for the so-called Stargoids to arrive. The Far God cult, which believes that the Thargoids are the angels of the apocalyptic death god known as the Far God, 
were a victim of the unrest in federal systems in particular. As happened before in 3304, they were accused of being Thargoid spies and were driven out by mobs with the active support and participation of the federal security forces. They remain in hiding aboard their megaships, the Perdition and the Testament. A different response to the coming of the Stargoids was the Thargoid Advocacy Project. This grassroots movement said that war with the Thargoids was pointless, and that if we could all sit down and talk over our differences, we could sort it all out, without anyone having to die. Opportunist federal politician Dalton Chase helped fund a peace megaship that would attempt to contact the first Stargoid. He was unfortunately unable to travel the peace mission himself, as were the vocal social media proponents of the movement. On the 24th of November, the peace megaship Kingfisher was destroyed, and everyone on board was killed by a fleet of Thargoid interceptors that had been following the first Stargoid, Tyrannus. If it had not been clear before, there was now no doubt left that the Thargoids were not open to peace overtures and that something terrible was about to happen. A few days later, on the 29th of November, the first of the eight Stargoids, Taranis, dropped into orbit around a pneumonia world in the Hyades Sector FB-N B7-6 system. At that moment of arrival, everything changed. Thargoids took over that system and a number of the surrounding systems and displayed a level of aggression more intense even than they had shown in HIP-22460. They intercepted and attacked ships in the area, pulling them out of hyperspace and, for the first time, from supercruise. They attacked and destroyed stations. For the first time, their targets included not only starports, but outposts and planetary bases. They ignored settlements, but the settlements were quickly abandoned by humanity in any case. For the first time, Thargoids were seen attacking human starports and other assets close up. In the following two weeks, the remaining seven Stargoids arrived and took control of other clusters of systems on the edge of the bubble. They became Maelstroms, a cloaking cloud of brown toxic gases hiding whatever huge devices the Thargoids have brought as their forward attack bases. It has not yet been possible to penetrate far into the clouds, but there's some hope that as technology develops, we may be able to peer inwards and to understand what it is we face, what we need to defeat to drive the Thargoids out of the bubble. There are systems fully under Thargoid control. These can be won back, but it is likely to be hard. There are systems under invasion where we must fight to drive the Thargoids back before they can take control. There are systems in an alert state where the Thargoids are using probes and sensors to check out the system before launching an invasion. If we destroy the Orthrus interceptors before they can collect their sensors, we know we can prevent the attacks from ever taking place. Humanity has responded in a more united way than ever before. Rescue ships with medical facilities have been stationed at a safe distance from the invasions to process those evacuated from the attacked systems. These rescue ships are also stocking a range of enhanced versions of the original Aegis anti-Xeno weaponry developed by Liz Ryder and Zachariah Nemo so that almost anyone can get involved in trying to contain the Thargoids. We're still learning the rules of this new anti-Thargoid warfare. We should know within the first few months of 3309 whether we have a chance of keeping the Thargoids within their current boundaries. But to defeat the Maelstroms and eliminate the Thargoid presence completely, we'll need new technology and probably to learn some new tricks as well. <laughs> 